Hi class, it's time to start our lecture on chapter 16, which involves mechanisms of infectious disease. Not all interactions between microorganisms and humans are detrimental. We actually have more prokaryotic cells in us than eukaryotic cells. So a human being is mostly bacteria. These bacteria acquire nutritional needs and shelter without the host, that would be us, being adversely affected. This interaction is known as commensalism, and the, colonization mi the colonizing microorganisms are sometimes referred to as commensal flora. Not only do we have microbes that live on us and in us, but we constantly walk through a fog of microbes. We walk around with a suit of armor, which is really dead protein on us, and that's part of our innate immune response. It's this dead, keratinized tissue around us. And we have saliva that contains enzymes and antibodies, like IgA, to ward off any bacteria that gets in our mouth. And if we swallow it, it goes down the esophagus into the acid pool of the stomach, and that's part of the innate system, too. You have tears that flush the eyes. Our eyes are the most sensitive to the are, are the most sensitive to these microbes and prone to infection. If we didn't have tears forming in our lacrimal glands, we would have more eye infections. Those tears contain proteolytic enzymes as well as antibodies. People who lack lacrimal fluid and have dry eyes literally can't see because their eyes become so encrusted with microbes on the cornea, usually within 24 hours. By the way, why do we cry? Crying was a bathing of the face, an antiseptic. If you were injured, crying allowed the tears to bathe the eyes and protected it from microbe invasion. So crying is for the act of dumping an antiseptic, not just for the eyes, but down on the face and so forth. The term mutualism is applied to an infection in which the microorganism and the host derive benefits from the interaction. There are also examples of microbes that live in us that are mutualistic. The term symbiosis means to live together. This long-term association between individuals of different species is often misinterpreted as always being a positive type of relationship where both organisms benefit. This is not true. There are actually three types of symbiosis with the interactions between the organisms ranging from win-win to win-lose. There are billions of microbes that have symbiotic relationships with people. Some live on the human body full-time, others are occasional interlopers. Normal flora are the microbes that live in and on the human body and are beneficial or neutral in their effect on the host. Therefore, normal flora are either mutualistic or commensalistic. Microbes that cause human disease have a parasitic relationship with their host and are referred to as pathogens. Commensalistic re relationships occur when one organism benefits while the other is not much affected for better or worse. Staph epidermidis is a gram-positive organism that is found on the surface of the skin. When living on the skin, these halophilic or salt-loving bacteria have a surface to grow on and are able to consume waste products that the skin generates. Staph epi are normal flora of the skin. They do not harm or directly help us, although they do take up space on the skin and thus crowd out potentially pathogenic bacteria. I have links up here on the screen if you would like to read more about commensal bacteria. Mutualistic symbiosis. Well, this is the win-win type of symbiosis in which both organisms benefit from cooperating. An example of a mutualistic relationship between a microbe and host is the normal flora that live in the human intestine. The bacteria get a place to live complete with a built-in food source and in return they benefit the host by aiding digestion and producing vitamin K. Vitamin K is another relation of microbes and is responsible for the synthesis of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Vitamin K is important and we get it in our diet, but not enough to sustain the level of blood clotting plasma proteins that the liver needs to produce. There's not enough in our diet, so we have bacterial flora in our intestine. And they're spread out between the small intestine and the large intestine, the colon. 
There's a whole battery of bacteria in our gut, and they are cranking out vitamin K. In mammals, other than primates, the concentration of the bacteria that make vitamin K is more in the appendix. For example, the appendix is the site of vitamin K for a horse. If you take an appendix out of a horse, you have to give supplements because that's a big part of the vitamin K reservoir. Where in humans, if you take the appendix out, you don't have to do this because the bacteria are spread, spread out more. We somehow lost that c concentration within the appendix. And that's why we say the appendix is vestigial. That means we really don't have a vital use for it anymore. So let's do this again. Within this category of mutualism is the multitude of bacteria that live in our gastrointestinal tract. In humans, the GI tract becomes rapidly colonized upon birth, as do other parts of the body. Microbial presence in the GI tract has been much studied because the mucosal surface of the gut affords more than 100 meters squared of inhabitable space. The gut microbial community is one of the most densely populated and the abundance and identities of bacterial species living in the GI tract are now being charted after being pursued for decades. The Human Microbiome Project has already highlighted the identification of approximately 30% of the known human gut microflora. A close second, at roughly 26%, is the resident microflora in the oral cavity. All in all, humans harbor trillions of bacteria living in tolerant, mutualistic symbiosis. An example of an opportunistic infection would include, it would include the fungi. Um, Candida fungi grow on the skin and have it right, and we have it right now on our skin and parts of the body. But when does it become disease? It becomes a disease when a person's immune system becomes compromised, when you're no longer able to ward it off. It's going on in your mouth, nostrils, etc. You are seeing in the top picture a person with Candida infection in the mouth called thrush. Babies get this a lot because of their immature immune system and drinking a lot of milk that feeds the fungus. Normally, we would have plenty of T and B cells all ready to attack. And another obvious immunocompromised population would be those with AIDS. Typically, you have 800 helper T cells per cubic millimeter in circulation, but a person with HIV the virus attacks specifically the CD4 or helper T cells and their numbers decrease to 200 or less Then that is AIDS. Sometimes you see AIDS patients with 50 or 25. That's when you see opportunistic infections like Canada, Aspergillus, Kaposi's. Kaposi's sarcoma was once a rare malignancy of the blood vessels but is now associated with AIDS. Recent research has suggested that this malignancy may be caused by a newly discovered herpes virus. The malignancy results in purplish grape-like lesions in the skin, gastrointestinal tract, and other organs. People with AIDS die from opportunistic infections, typically pneumonia. Animal domestication is what scholars call the process of developing the mutually useful relationship between animals and humans. Over the past 12,000 years, humans have learned to control their access to food and other necessities of life by changing the behaviors and natures of wild animals. All of the animals that we use today, such as dogs, cats, cattle, sheep, camels, geese, horses, and pigs, started out as wild animals but were changed over the centuries and millennia into tamer, quieter animals. Some of the ways people benefit from a domesticated animal include keeping cattle in pens for access to milk and meat, and for pulling plows, training dogs to be guardians and companions, teaching horses to adapt to use the plow or take a, a rider, and changing the lean, nasty wild boar into a fat, friendly farm animal. Different animals were domesticated in different parts of the world and at different times. You can find a description of when and where different animals were turned from wild beasts to be hunted or avoided into animals we could live with and rely on. And I give this website in the transcript. 
Why is it we have the diseases that we have? You look at smallpox, measles, and flu, all the common kinds of diseases that we have, and there's a very close relationship between these diseases and the fact that humans domesticated plants and animals. With domestication came populations that didn't need to move as much, they were sedentary, and became more dense and closer to water. And animal waste runoff con uh, uh, contaminated that water. And animals were th the original harbor of those diseases. And it was only the contact between the animals that were domesticated and the humans that brought forth these evolutionary changes within the microbes themselves to infect humans. If we had not domesticated the animals, we would not have had as many of the plagues that we had. Measles, TB, and smallpox were, were originally found in cattle and jumped to the host of human. The flu it was pigs and birds. Pertussis, whooping cough, was from pigs and dogs. Malaria, from birds and mosquitoes that bit them. And AIDS, from the green monkey, because the thought was the harboring virus was in the monkey that actually bit the person and actually recently the more common idea is that the hunter killed the monkey and was cutting up the flesh and accidentally cut himself. Anyway, that's how it originally spread. And of course, the evolution of the microbe needs to be addressed here. They have to evolve to a condition which is now harmful to the human. And why would the microbe want to do that? So they can survive and so they can create a mechanism which we call sickness. The signs and symptoms we associate with the disease actually promote the survival of the microbe. So when you looked at the symptomology of the diseases, you're always looking at how those symptoms in the human benefit the organism itself. And you see this with countless examples. Sneezing when someone has the flu. And the fact that they're coughing and sneezing is now allowing the microbe to be airborne. Domesticated animals were also essential in the European march toward world domination. Horses were important because foot soldiers can't stand long against a warrior on horseback. But the real way we devastated the native people of North, South, and Central America was through disease. Many experts believe that by the time Europeans returned to the Americas with conquest in mind, smallpox and other diseases from earlier contact had already wiped out around 95% of the native population. Europeans had evolved a partial immunity to the deadly disease ever since they domesticated its original host, cattle. In contrast, Native Americans had only domesticated the turkey and the dog, so they had no similar deadly diseases to rebuff us with. If you want to read more, you can see the literature that I have on the screen by Jared Diamond, and he discusses the way Europeans dominated other cultures. In essence, overpopulation gave us the impetus to dominate the world, and agriculture gave us the means. Clearly, wheat has a lot to answer for. But we have to look at the immune system of the Native Americans, too. They were never exposed to pathogens. Do you remember the story of Pizarro? He was a Spanish explorer, Francisco Pizarro, and he conquered the Inca Empire in Peru. He had only 600 men and the Incas were two million strong. It was the disease that allowed Pizarro to conquer the Incas. And the natives lacking a strong immune response to these pathogens comes back to the example of some children living in extremely sterile environments. And these children have very little defense because of the sterile environment not allowing them to select for T and B cells that would then help fight infection. Now, it's not that they need to go out and roll in the dirt occasionally, but it wouldn't hurt. We have our innate system, of course, but we need also our acquired immune system. We acquire it, and the only way we acquire it is to be exposed to the pathogens and microbes that can give us natural resistance. Without that, we are running the risk of then becoming too dependent on antibiotics because if there is not a natural warding off of disease or natural defense, then the next line of defense is antibiotics. And now we end up with methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus auroris, or MRSA. Because of the misuse, especially of antibiotics in the U.S., 
the laws governing the dispensing of medicines is quite different than in Europe. It is much tighter there. If you want an antibiotic there, you have to present with a lot more symptoms. Here, you walk in the office, the first thing they give you is an antibiotic. So the advent of domestication of animals resulted in denser human populations, which provided ripe conditions for pathogens to reproduce, mutate, spread, and eventually find a new host in humans. Let's keep in mind our previous discussion that not all microbes are harmful, but let's now talk about what makes them harmful, especially if we keep in mind the domestication of animals and the viruses gaining the ability to infect one animal and then infect a different animal, say from pig to human, like in the swine flu. It's about evolution. These microbes have to evolve to cause a condition which is now harmful to the human. And again, why would they want to do that? So they can survive and so they can create a mechanism which we call sickness. What we call signs and symptoms and so forth are really mechanisms that promote the survival of the microbe. So when you look at the symptoms of the diseases, you're always looking at how those symptoms in the human benefit the organism itself. And you see this with countless examples. With sneezing, someone has the flu, and they're coughing and sneezing, the virus is now airborne. That means the virus can spread. Open wounds with venereal diseases, cholera with diarrhea, rabies and the frenzy of biting. Go Cujo! When a dog or animal is infected with a virus that causes rabies, it actually causes muscle contraction of the jaw, which is why they have that frenzy of biting. The only animal that is immune to the virus that causes rabies is the bat which is why if the bat bites you, we are worried about the transmission of the virus to you. All of these are examples of how the microbe must be, quote, shed, if you will, from one organism so it can infect another. If it can't, then the organism it is in will eventually die or launch an immune response against the microbe. Either way, the microbe will die, either from the immune system of the host or when the host dies. Let's apply this to something else. The AIDS highway is an interesting one. We know it started in the Central African region and it had actually been in the Central African region for many years and whole villages were wiped out. There were a lot of little villages scattered around the Congo and scattered around Central Afri Africa. And literally scientists would go into these areas and this was in the 60s and 70s and whole villages were decimated. Nobody there. The die-off rate was so great that they would ab abandon the village and then move elsewhere. We know there are a number of viral conditions in Central Africa and also in South America that are confined to given areas. So what happens when they get out? And that's what I'm referring to with the AIDS highway. They started chopping trees down in the central Congo and when they were bringing the trees down they would put them on trucks and drive them to the west coast to ship to Europe and the United States. They had, had to build a highway and that highway is called the AIDS highway because along the way there were brothels and as the truck drivers would move the trees they would get involved with the women in the brothels and that's how HIV spread. And it finally spread to Europe and Scandinavia and then the USA and that was all in just a very short amount of time. And the question is what else is in that incubator where viruses are found in great numbers? Microbes that we haven't even seen yet. Diseases like AIDS that will eventually come out. That's a real fear among epidemiologists that in that incubator of forest and jungle we do have diseases that we haven't seen yet and we have no resistance to. Now we're finding in AIDS some people who have a natural resistance and we'll talk about that later. You know, diseases have come and gone. Why? The virus, the bacterium mutates to infect the human and then mutates again so it is no longer virulent. Some examples of this are the Fort Bragg fever which broke out in 1942. 
Unique sy symptoms. Lasted about a year and to date, no other cases. No one knows what caused it or how it spread. You can read about it in the Office of Medical History of the U.S. Army Medical Department and the soldiers presented with a funny rash on their shins. And I give the website in the transcript. Now, I don't know how to pronounce this, but I'm just going to try. Anongadongadong. This fever was uh, presented in Central Africa, and it came and went. And the name of this disease was pain in joints. Then there was the English sweating sickness. It started in a series of epidemics beginning in 1485. The last outbreak occurred in 1551, after which the disease apparently vanished. Again, the virus mutated. The onset of symptoms was dramatic and sudden, with death often occurring within hours. Its cause remains unknown. And again, nobody has had a case of it since it erupted and went away. I'll post a few papers on the English sweats and the Picardy sweats, written by British and French physicians. Since 1578, the only outbreaks <coughs> of a disease resembling the English sweats have been those of the Picardy sweat which occurred frequently in France between 1718 and 1861. In this illness, however, there was an invariably a rash that lasted about a week, and the mortality rate compared to the English sweating sickness was much lower. This picture is a depiction of the English sweats, and when the fever broke, if it did break, the patient would suffer from excessive somnolence and wanting to sleep. When the physician saw the fever was breaking and the patient would begin to get very tired, the physician would try and prevent them from sleeping and feared that they would sleep, slip into a coma and never wake up. Speaking of disease that has come and gone, let's talk about the plague. Actually, the plague came from an organism about 10,000 years ago. This organism, which was a bacterium, split into three different biotypes. The Yersinia pseudotuberculosis is sort of the ancient great-great-great-grandfather of the organism that caused plague. When we think of plague, I'm sure you've all learned a little about, about Black Death and the stories of 13th century Europe. There are actually three biotypes produced, three different types of plague. There is the pneumonia type. There is a type where the patient bleeds out, a septicemia, infection of the blood. And the other is called bubonic, what we normally think of as plague. Bubo was a term to refer to our lymph nodes, and bubonic plague was diagnosed because the lymph nodes would swell, especially around the arms and neck. The three different kinds of plague all occurred at different times in history. For instance, we have had three pandemics of the plague. What's the difference, by the way, between epidemic and a pandemic? An epidemic is over a confined area. And a pandemic is a much bigger area. For example, Europe, pandemic, and Paris, epidemic. We've had about three pandemics. The grandfather of the bacteria, Y. Pseudotuber pseudotuberculosis, turned into a virulent type, Y. pestis, which is a gram-negative anaerobic bacterium. Normally, this is a zoonotic type of disease, we have a flea that is infected that bites a rodent who becomes infected, and another flea bites a rodent and becomes infected. The bacteria will multiply and causes blood to block the stomach, which will cause the flea to starve. So the flea starts to bite more, and as it bites, the flea vomits blood because blood cannot go into the stomach, and now the bacterium is in a mammalian host. So we will see fleas and rodents being a common thread in the spread and development of plague. Let's talk about the Justinian plague. The first recorded pandemic called the Justinian plague, and it happened after the 6th century, and they named it this because the Byzantine emperor was Justinian I. The Justinian uh, became, uh, began in that age, I should say, began in 541 A.D., and was followed by frequent outbreaks over the next 200 years. I'm talking about the Justinian Plague. And it eventually killed about 100 million people in and around Egypt and Central Asia. It was traced to bartering and people coming in from Asia. 
and it introduced itself to the Western world by trade routes especially the bringing in of animal trades because all of those animals carried fleas and the flea was ex chiapis and these fleas they were also carried around by rats especially the black rats and its genus and species names is ratus ratus i just love that one and the rats bring in the fleas and the fleas carry the biotypes of y pseudotuberculosis the Y pseudotuberculosis developed into three biotypes of disease, and each of these biotypes have been identified as being caused by Y pestis. And the Y pestis is the cause of all three pandemics, but in every case, the three pandemics had different symptoms. They weren't the same disease, even though they were called the plague. The Justinian plague presented with necrosis of the extremities, notably the hand. So we believe it was the septicemia type. Again, this plague was spread so readily from its origin in Central Asia. And again, how did it start? The bacterium was harbored in the ratus ratus, and then when the bacterium entered the flea, it mutated into the more virulent type. It had to mutate to live in the flea at room temperature versus in a warm mammal. It went from the Yersinia pseudotuberculosis to Yersinia pestis. And this caused the symptomology, the disease, that we associate with the plague. The plague killed 10,000 people a day, and over time it killed over 100 million people. You can go to the Center of Disease Control website that I have on this screen to read more if you'd like. Again, we believe the Justinian plague was the septicemic bioform. The bacteria that causes septicemic plague multiplies in the bloodstream, and this can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation. It causes clots throughout the body, which can lead to necrosis of the tissue. That is the uncivilized way for tissues to die, remember. The symptoms of it are very similar to what we are going to see in the bubonic plague, with swollen lymph nodes, but additionally there was abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and that would be from the disseminated intravascular coagulation, bleeding from the mouth, nose, rectum, under the skin. There was shock and blackening of the tissues, which inspired the term black death. Now, the black plague, or bubonic plague, was the second pandemic, widely known as black death, or the great plague. It originated in China in 1334 and spread along the great trade routes to Constantinople and then to Europe, where it claimed an estimated 60% of the European population. Entire towns were wiped out. Some contemporary historians report that, on occasion, there were not enough survivors remaining to bury the dead. Dying of the Black Plague, or from it, I should say, was horrible but very fast. Some historians would say you'd have lunch with your family and dinner with your ancestors. That was the plague. Swelling, high fever, convulsions, death. Very quick. Bodies were piled up. It changed the economics, the history of the earth. It changed the way people lived and the way cities were built. Nursery rhymes involved description of the plague. Ring around the rosies. That's a reference to the swollen lymph glands. Pocket full of posies. So many deaths that the bodies were piled up in carts, and to eliminate the odor, they would have flowers tucked into the pockets of the dead. And that's why we started to bring flowers to funerals. Carnations, in fact, were bred for their scent and had a strong smell. And that's why it's considered the funeral flower. As a side note, the phrase, God bless you, was also developed during this time because when a person sneezed, that was thought to be the beginning of the bubonic plague. So they were blessing you into death. In this picture, you see a person wearing a hat, a mask suggestive of a bird beak, goggles or glasses, and a long gown. The clothing identifies the person as a plague doctor and is intended as protection. Descriptions indicate that the gown was made from heavy fabric or leather and was usually waxed. The beak contained pungent substances like herbs or perfumes, thought at the time to purify the air and helpful in re relieving the stench. 
The person also carries a pointer or rod to keep the patients at a distance. And in the other picture, I show a person infected with the plague. Symptoms can be present for two to eight days. And they include fevers, chills, headache, fatigue, muscle pain, severe pain in any region of that body, muscles, abdomen, etc. This leads us to the third pandemic, the modern plague. It began in China in the 1860s and appeared in Hong Kong by 1894. Over the next 20 years, it spread to port cities around the world by rats on steamships. The pandemic caused approximately 10 million deaths. During this last pandemic, scientists identified the causative agent as being a bacterium and determined that plague is spread by infectious flea bites. Rat-associated plague was soon brought under control in most urban areas, but the infection easily spread to local populations of ground squirrels and other small mammals in America, Africa, and Asia. These new species of carriers have allowed plague to become endemic in many rural areas, including the western U.S. And this was both the bubonic and pneumonic types. It was 100% fatal if not treated immediately, especially because it could travel to the lungs. When a person would cough, another person could inhale the infectious droplets, coughed into the air, and this would form symptoms in the next person. High fever, weakness, respiratory problems, nausea, and vomiting. Russia was also affected with this plague. However, as a bacterial disease, plague can be treated with antibiotics and can be prevented from spreading by prompt identification, treatment, and management of human cases. Applications of effective insecticides to control the flea vectors also provide assistance in controlling plague. Interesting thought. There was a physician named Michael Crichton who wrote the book The Andromeda Strain. Basically, a space probe goes up and brings back a microbe, and a little town gets decimated, and they bring in the military and P4 labs and all these funny suits. They try to make a vaccine, blah, 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 and the virus is spreading. Then there are only six pages left. Did I lose a chapter, or is something going to happen in six pages? What happens? Well, basically, the virus mutated. End of story. That's what happened with the plague. The Justinian plague had a certain virulent strain that over a period of time mutated out of its virulence. And we have Y. pestis in all of us. It's part of our normal microbe, but it's not a virulent strain. Part of the questions are, what happened to some of the diseases, like Picardy sweats, the English sweats? What happened? The virus evolved into a level of virulence, and then it evolved again and lost its virulence. Could it come back? Yes, it just hasn't come back yet. Prions. There's a thought in infectious disease that in order to have an agent, it needs to contain DNA and or RNA. It needs some kind of life form, and in the case of proteins that cause crutzfeld jakob disease and scrapie in sheep, this isn't the case. The term prion is from proteinaceous infectious, the proteinaceous infectious particles, to offset it from virus and even virions. There's usually a 20-year latent period between the infection and the onset of symptoms. And it's called scrapie in sheep because the sheep would get weird skin disorders and scrape against the barbed wire, and then they would, the barbed wire would cut in the wool and the skin, and then the screw worms would come in. The equivalent of scrapie has been found in humans in New Guinea through the practice of kuru. That is a practice of removing the brains of, a, of dead individuals having the prion. And it was really strange because the people who survived, if it were, say, a man who died and he died from the prion disease, his wife and children would be expected to eat the brains of him. That was considered the royalty part of the dead person. And then the other parts of the body were given out to good friends, neighbors, etc. We know that prion disease can be inherited or familial, that's what that means, or sporadic, meaning a sudden mutation, 
causing the prion protein to mutate, again, spontaneously. And we also know it to be transmissible or infectious. And because it has all three, hereditary, spontaneous, transmissible, infectious, it took scientists quite a bit of time to determine its etiology. With prion diseases, it is very difficult to determine etiology. Is it hereditary, sporadic, transmissible? That It's all of those. And it was a long, long heated debate. And now we know it's all of these. And for a long time, until they could figure this out, they had this viral hypothesis. They called it slow viruses because the incubation times were months to years. And the infectious agents were filterable, and this caused problems because 95% of prion disease cannot be linked to infection. So there goes the viral hypothesis. And 10 to 15% of those with the disease was found to be dominantly inherited. Just a brief hist uh, historical view. Kretzfeld-Jakob disease, CJD, gertzmann strausler Schenker disease, and fatal familial insomnia, all of those are the inherited forms. There is the transmissible type, the actual infect infectious type, and that was found in tribes that lived in New Guinea where they would practice cannibalism, as I said, it's Kuru. And what do we see in a person with prion disease? We see neurological effects, including ataxia, that means a problem moving, and also dementia. Okay, so this, because of not being able to find a virus associated with it, this started the protein-only hypothesis. Now, the prion, and there, there are different prions, there, there are two. There's a PRPC, the C stands for cellular, or the normal protein. Then there is the PRPSC. PRP stands for prion protein, and SC is scrapy. One of the things that was difficult to understand was how do proteins reproduce? If they have no genetic qualities, there's no particular type of reproduction, like in DNA or RNA. How does a protein reproduce itself then? How do we go from a normal prion protein, PRPC, to the abnormal protein, PRPSC? Well, it seems that the protein can act like a seed. And once you get one bad protein, it can get it into contact with other soluble proteins and turn soluble proteins into insoluble proteins. The PRPC is a soluble form, a soluble form and the PRPSC is insoluble. And it's the insoluble that lodges into the cell, particularly neurons, and causes the characteristic type of madness and deterioration. And the neurodegeneration is what gets you. And it literally looks like the brain is being eaten away from the inside out. Now, don't mix that up with mad cow's disease. Mad cow's disease, or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, is a disease of animals. It's a disease of encephalopathy, of getting the prions in the brains of cattle. In order for a human to contract that, they're going to have to get or eat, ingest, some of the brain tissue from the infected cow. So this protein-only hypothesis developed because we knew that prions were mysterious agents. They were transmissible, yes, but they didn't have any RNA or DNA material. After trying to sterilize instruments that were known to, and with methods that were known to destroy nucleic acids, failed, scientists asked, how could it be viral in nature then? That wiped out the viral hypothesis. And they also noticed that these infectious agents could be destroyed somewhat after rigorous protease treatment. And this led the scientists to think of the protein-only hypothesis that the protein had to be an aberrantly folded protein that could cause other soluble, well-folded proteins to suddenly unravel and refold in an aberrant manner, again, acting like a seed. 
Let me briefly tell you about the sporadic prion disease. The sporadic form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is one in a million, and this likely represents the magnitude of probability that a normally folded prion protein will convert spontaneously to the misfolded type, the SC type. That is, the PRPC cellular type is highly stable, and it has a one in a million chance of Auto uh, automatically converting. And once this conversion occurs into a protein that is PRPSC, that aberrant protein can now act as a seed and cause other PRPC proteins to convert into the aberrant form. We also know that prion disease is hereditary. We know that there are mutations resulting uh, or happening in specific genes. And I give you a picture on the screen of the human prion gene found on chromosome 20. We know that the autosomal dominant inheritance of these mutations destabilize the wild type isoform. In other words, it lowers the threshold for the PRPC variety to more easily develop into the PRPSC variety. Familial or hereditary prion disease include Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, the GSS disease that I told you about, and fatal familial insomnia. Interestingly, fatal familial insomnia was first described in 1986 as an autosomal dominant heredop heredopathy clinically characterized by progressive untreatable insomnia, dysautonomia, and motor signs. The neuropathological hallmark of FFI is predominance of lesions in the thalamus. Genetically, FFI is linked to a GAC to AAC point mutation, aspartic acid to asparagine, asparagine substitution at codon 178 of the prion protein gene PRNP. On chromosome 20, um, is where this happens in conjunction with methionine at the polymorphic position of 129 of the mutant allele. There's actually a huge interesting story on the prion protein exon 1, exon 2, exon 3 and in a future class maybe I'll add that as part of our material. Kuru. As I said before, the transmission, transmissible form of prion disease was first discovered in the form of cannibalism, or Kuru. Kuru was the disease that the New Guinea population tribe named, uh, used as a name for their prion disease. Kuru was transmissible because of ritualistic cannibalization. The family members were regarded as responsible for eating the best part of their deceased family member. So that was usually the brain. So we speculate that the first person who had this disease was maybe named Kuru. Maybe that person had a sporadic or spontaneous mutation that led to the prion disease and then the tribe subsequently reinfects itself due to the cannibalism. Now this particular tribe, the women and children would be left behind and they would eat the brains of the deceased husband and father and it got to the point where the rate of births and population doubling practically halted in particular tribes. And it was because the women and children would be wiped out from this. There were only men mostly left. So scientists and also religious leaders went to these islands and educated the people. And the ritual has been abandoned now for about 50 plus years. So how did we prove that transmission was possible? They took the brains from the people in New Guinea who had Kuru and they injected the parts of these brains or some parts of them, into primates, chimpanzees. And then they got the disease. There was also a link between Kuru and Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. One comparison of these two brains from people who had them looked exactly the same. The brain mass just looks eaten away. The Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease breed, when extracts were removed from them and injected into chimps, this too led to prion disease in the chimps. So this was the proof that it could be transmitted. Here is a picture of two brains. The one on the left is consumed by the prion disease, 
and you can see that the amount of brain mass is just wasted away. There is more ventricular space. You see the basal ganglia are gone, just truly like half the size. Though classified as a bovine disease, bovine spongiform encephalopathy is transmissible to humans, causing what is now known as the new variant crutzfeldt jakob disease, or NVCJD. The disease is contracted when humans eat food products that have been exposed to or contaminated with the brain, spinal cord, or digestive remains of cows previously infected with BSE. This encourages the appearance of prions, which are misfolded proteins. These proteins promote the refolding of native proteins into a diseased state, which inherently disrupts cell function and causes cell death. The symptoms of this disease in humans mirror the symptoms of cows when prions permeate the brain and cause decay, dementia, loss of motor function, and ultimately death. Again, in this example of transmitted prion disease, there is no mutation in the person or in their prion gene. They simply are eating contaminated food from cows that had mad cow disease, or bovine spongiform encephalopathy.